dive into the chilling world of true crime as we explore the twisted minds of five notorious serial killers, Joel Rifkin, Charles Cullen, David Berkowitz, Satomo Miyazaki, and Bobby Joe Long uncover the dark motives, gruesome details, and the relentless pursuit of justice as we delve into their haunting stories. Fewer discretion is advised as we examine the disturbing tales of these infamous murderers in our latest video. Brace yourself for a spine-tingling journey through the depths of human depravity. Joel Rifkin This killer terrorized New York from the years of 1989 to 1993. Though his name is not as well known as the likes of Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy, Joel Rifkin nonetheless numbers among the most prolific serial killers in American history. Sometimes known as the Drifter, Rifkin was eventually convicted of killing at least nine women, many of them sex workers, and may have been responsible for the deaths of as many as twice that number. As far as we know, Joel Rifkin committed his first murder in February of 1989, in his home in East Meadow, New York. His victim was Heidi Balch, and the exact method of her execution is difficult to say, because of the extreme duress under which he put her body once she was dead. He removed her teeth and fingernails, cut off her head and left it in a paint can on a golf course in Hopewell, New Jersey, then dismembered her body and disposed of her legs, arms, and torso in different places across the tri-state area. Though much of Balch's body was found at various times throughout 1989, her remains were not identified until 2013, and by then Rifkin had claimed many more victims. As a young man, Rifkin had struggled in school. He was unpopular, and never excelled academically, but he showed some talent for landscaping, a career that he claimed to want to pursue. While still living at home, he told his mother that he wanted to start his own landscaping business. To this end, she helped him to buy a 1978 van and a trailer. While he did undertake some landscaping contracts, the van and trailer were also put to work in his more nefarious business, claiming the lives of more than a dozen women over the next few years. It was also under the guise of his landscaping business that Rifkin bought two more trucks and rented storage space to house the various vehicles and trailers. This rented storage space would become his hideout for his murders, and also the place where he kept trophies of each killing, usually jewelry or clothing taken from his victims. In May of 1991, he picked up Barbara Jacobs, who was likely his second or third victim. If she was his third, then the body of his second victim has still never been found. Barbara Jacobs was, though, dead and stuffed into a garbage bag near the Hudson River. Over the course of the next year, Rifkin would claim several more victims, disposing of their bodies in a variety of ways, including a steamer trunk and a dump near the military academy at West Point. Beginning around Christmas of 1991, Rifkin purchased four 55-gallon steel drums, ostensibly for his landscaping company. He used these to dispose of the bodies of several of his victims, dumping them into nearby rivers. When he ran out of drums, he returned to other methods, including hiding the body of one of his victims under a mattress and dismembering another, and depositing her body in a suitcase. Sometimes, he would keep the remains in his storage unit for several days before disposing of them. All told, Joel Rifkin claimed the lives of at least nine women, and likely many more. The estimate for his murders in New York total around 17, and he has been compared to the prolific and unidentified Long Island serial killer known as the Craigslist Ripper, who claimed as many as 18 victims, though Rifkin was already in prison by the time those crimes were committed. Rifkin's last victim was Tiffany Bresciani. At the time, Bresciani was dating Dave Rubenstein, a singer and co-founder of the hardcore punk group Breaking Youth, which sought to draw parallels between young Republicans and Hitler Youth, while also comparing the policies of the Reagan administration and American conservatives with the beliefs of hate groups, a stance given added urgency by the fact that Rubenstein's parents were Holocaust survivors. By the time Rubenstein met Bresciani, however, the band had broken up, and Bresciani supported both Rubenstein and their shared drug habit through sex work. Rubenstein routinely waited up for Bresciani while she was with clients, which is how he came to identify Joel Rifkin. On June 24, 1993, Bresciani left with a familiar customer in a Mazda pickup truck, telling Rubenstein that she would be back in 20 minutes. When she didn't return, he called the police with a description of the truck. For days later, 
two New York State troopers pulled over a pickup truck without a license plate. Inside, under a tarp, they found Presciani's body. Rifkin had kept it in his storage unit over the weekend and was hauling it away to dispose of it when he was pulled over. Though Presciani was dead, it was the beginning, rather than the end, of Rubenstein's misfortune. Just two days after Joel Rifkin was arrested, Rubenstein's mother died in a freak accident. Three days later, Rubenstein took his own life. In a way, he could be considered Rifkin's final victim. In 1994, Joel Rifkin was convicted of nine counts of second-degree murder and sentenced to 203 years in prison, a sentence he is currently serving at the Clinton Correctional Facility in Dannemora, New York. During his trial, it came out that Rifkin committed his murders out of psychosexual sadism. He said that even before he began killing, he was obsessed with the Alfred Hitchcock film Frenzy and would masturbate to the scenes in which women were strangled. Since his arrest, Rifkin's notoriety has been such that prison authorities have deemed it impractical to keep him in the general population. During the early years of his incarceration, before he was transferred to Dannemora, he spent more than four years in solitary confinement, eventually bringing a lawsuit over his treatment. Despite this, Rifkin has sometimes been consulted by newspapers for opinions about other serial killers who have haunted the same Long Island area that he also terrorized. Charles Cullen Charles Cullen is an American serial killer and a former nurse. He has confessed to killing 40 patients during the course of his career as a nurse. The authorities estimate that the actual number of patients killed by Cullen may be around 400. Cullen had a troubled and unstable frame of mind right from his childhood. He first attempted suicide at the age of nine. As a youngster, Cullen enlisted in the U.S. Navy, but he did not fit in and attempted suicide. After resigning from the Navy, Cullen joined a nursing school. He worked as a nurse in several hospitals. Cullen murdered several patients in these hospitals by giving them an overdose of drugs. For 16 years, Cullen's crimes went unnoticed. His colleagues reported about his suspicious behavior, but no actions were taken. The authorities at Somerset Medical Center got sufficient proof of Cullen's wrongdoing. He was arrested and charged with one murder. During interrogation, Cullen admitted to committing several murders in the past. He is currently serving a life imprisonment without parole for over 100 years. Charles Edmund Cullen was born on February 22, 1960, in West Orange, New Jersey, to Edmund and Florence. He was the last of eight children of his parents. His father died when Cullen was seven months old. During his childhood, he displayed symptoms of mental instability and was constantly bullied by his sister's boyfriend and his schoolmates. At the age of nine, Cullen committed his first suicide attempt by drinking chemicals. In 1977, his mother was killed in a car accident. This event devastated the already troubled Cullen. He dropped out of high school a year later. After discontinuing his studies, Charles Cullen joined the U.S. Navy. He served on the submarine USS Woodrow Wilson. He rose to the rank of petty officer, but was unable to cope with the underwater life. He was often bullied by his colleagues. Cullen was subjected to disciplinary action when an officer spotted him wearing surgical mask and gloves while doing the control duty of missiles. After being transferred to duty aboard a ship, Cullen attempted suicide. In 1984, he received a medical discharge from the Navy. Following his exit from the Navy, Cullen joined the Mountainside Hospital School of Nursing to learn nursing. In 1986, he graduated from the school. Cullen started his nursing career at the Street Point Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston. Cullen confessed to murdering several patients while working there. In June 1988, he administered a lethal overdose of medication to a patient. He gave an overdose of insulin to a patient who suffered from AIDS. An investigation into the contaminated four bags found at the hospital pointed to Cullen as the suspect, but due to lack of evidence, no action was taken against him. After resigning from his job at the Street Point Barnabas, Charles Cullen joined the Warren Hospital. While working there, he murdered three elderly women by administering an overdose of digoxin. 
In September 1993, a cancer patient at the hospital complained that Cullen injected her with some medicines, although he was not her assigned nurse. These charges were dismissed, as Cullen passed the lie detector test conducted by the hospital. Cullen's next workplace was the Hunterdon Medical Center. He confessed to the murder of five patients at the hospital, with an overdose of digoxin. He was treated for depression while he was working at Warren Hospital and Hunterdon Medical Center. Later, he worked with the Liberty Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. He was found guilty of the death of one patient there. In March 1999, Charles Cullen was hired by the Lehigh Valley Hospital. He committed one murder and attempted another while working there. After resigning from there, Cullen joined the St. Luke's Hospital in Bethlehem. He murdered five patients while working at the cardiac care unit of the hospital. In January 2000, Cullen attempted a suicide. His colleagues at the Street Point Luke grew suspicious when they saw vials of medicines in disposal bags. In June 2002, Cullen was forced to resign. Though seven of his co-workers filed a complaint against Cullen with the district attorney, the case was dropped due to lack of evidence. In September 2002, Cullen joined the Somerset Medical Center. He murdered 13 patients by mid-2003. As the frequency of crimes increased, authorities grew suspicious. An examination of computerized records revealed that Cullen had requested for medications that were not prescribed for his patients. Cullen murdered his last victim in October 2003, where the patient died of low blood sugar. With the help of a co-worker, Amy Lufren, police collected evidences about the crimes of Cullen. After a month-long investigation, he was arrested in December 2003. The charges were murder of Reverend Florian Gall and attempted murder of Jean Kyun Han. After his arrest, Cullen confessed to his earlier crimes, totaling 40. During court proceedings, Charles Cullen agreed to cooperate with authorities on condition that they will refrain from seeking death sentence for his crimes. He stated that he committed the crimes in order to end the suffering of the patients, but investigations showed that all of his victims were not terminal patients. His claims of wanting to save the patients from suffering were refuted by the court. Charles Cullen was found guilty of murders. He is currently serving a life imprisonment without parole for over 100 years. Charles Cullen was married to Adrian Baum. After a while into marriage, Cullen's wife found his behavior very disturbing and sought divorce, which was granted. The court ordered Cullen to bear his child's expenses. The case of Charles Cullen revealed the lack of a proper legal framework for reporting suspicious behavior by healthcare workers. Prompted by this case, 35 states in the United States enacted laws for ensuring the safety of hospitalized patients. David Berkowitz One of the most infamous serial killers in the history of the United States, David Berkowitz terrorized America like very few have before. He is convicted of killing six people and brutally injuring seven others during the second half of the 1970s. Nicknamed Son of Sam and the .44 caliber killer, because of his choice of weapon, a .44 caliber bulldog revolver, Berkowitz eluded the police on multiple occasions and continued his shooting spree. A huge manhunt, probably the biggest in the New York history, was initiated for the capture of the notorious killer, but he successfully eluded it for a long time. In the process, he left letters for the police mocking them at their inability to catch him. Newspapers and tabloids covered his activities in great details and he achieved a somewhat celebrity status during the time. Terror reigned supreme, especially in New York, as the number of his victims kept rising with time. He was finally apprehended by the New York Police Homicide Department and sentenced by the Court of the Land. David Berkowitz was born Richard David Falco on June 1, 1953, in Brooklyn, New York. His mother, Elizabeth Broder, was first married to Tony Falco, but the marriage didn't last. She conceived David with her new partner, Joseph Kleinman, but chose to give him the surname Falco for reasons best known to her. A few days after his birth, he was adopted by a middle-aged, childless Jewish couple, Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz. They altered his name to David Richard Berkowitz. His childhood was a troubled one. 
Although he was a child of above-average intelligence, he was caught up in dishonorable activities like petty theft and bullying. He was distraught after the death of his adoptive mother, whom he adored, when he was just 14. He joined the U.S. Army in 1971 when he was 18 years old. After three years of service, he was discharged honorably from the force in 1974, following which he came back to New York. He got a job at the Postal Service and stayed at a rented apartment in the city. It was during this time that he located his biological mother and discovered that she has a half-sister by the name of Rosalind. Some psychologists believe that the primary cause of his mental troubles is rooted in the abandonment issues that he faced from his biological parents. Berkowitz's violence spree started in the mid-1970s. His primary targets were young women and couples. His profiling stated that he preferred women with long, dark, and wavy hair the most. According to Berkowitz, his first act of serious violence occurred on December 24, 1975, when he tried to stab two women with a hunting knife. This story has remained unconfirmed and the police have failed to establish a concrete link between him and the victim, Michelle Foreman. His first confirmed attack took place on July 29, 1976, near Pelham Bay, Bronx. Two women, Donna Loria and Jody Valenti, were sitting in a car outside Loria's apartment when he fired bullets on them. Loria died on the spot after a bullet hit her on her chest, but Valenti, who was shot on her thigh, survived. She later gave a description to the police of the man who she thought was the shooter. According to her, the shooter was a white male in his 30s, about 1.75 m tall and weighing around 160 pounds, with short and curly hair. The son of Sam struck for the second time on October 23, 1976, when he took an aim at a couple near Baum Park in Queens. The couple, Carl De Niro and Rosemary Keenan, was sitting in a parked car when Berkowitz took a shot at them. Although both of them survived the shooting, De Niro's skull was severely damaged and required major surgery to heal. In the November of the same year, he targeted two young girls, Donna DeMacy and Joanne Lomino, as they were returning home after a movie. DeMacy was shot in the neck but she recovered in a few days. Lomino, on the other hand, was shot in the back and the injury ultimately left her a paraplegic. Berkowitz struck again in the wee hours of January 30, 1977, when he shot Christine Freund and her fiancé John Deal near the Forest Hills LIRR station in Queens. Deal survived the attack but Freund, who was shot twice, succumbed to her injuries in a few hours. It was after this attack that the police finally acknowledged that this might be the work of a serial killer. His next victim was a college student, Virginia Voskarikian. On March 8, 1977, she was shot in the head with a .44 caliber on her way back home from school. After the details of this incident were revealed, the press and media went berserk with the story of the serial killer roaming the streets of New York. On April 17, 1977, yet another couple turned into the victim of the .44 caliber killer. Alexander Esau and Valentina Suriani were both shot twice in their car. Neither survived the attack. The police found a letter at the crime scene addressed to the captain and warning them that he will be back. The writer of the letter identified himself as the son of Sam. The next attack took place on June 26, 1977, on Sal Lapo and Judy Placido. Fortunately, both of them survived their injuries. The final attack, before he was arrested, took place in Brooklyn on July 31, 1977. The victims, Stacy Moskowitz and Bobby Violanti, were in a car when they were attacked. Moskowitz died in hospital later, but Violanti survived, although he was blinded in one eye. There were many witnesses at the Moskowitz Violanti shooting site. The police took their testimony and discovered a partial number plate of the car that the murderer was driving. Upon further investigation, the car was found to be registered to David Berkowitz. On August 10, 1977, the police arrested him from outside his house at 35 Pine Street in Yonkers. He confessed to all the shootings on the next day in custody and claimed that he was made to do everything by his neighbor Sam Carr's dog, which spoke to him and demanded young girl's blood. 
Berkowitz pleaded guilty on all charges against him and was sentenced to six 25 years to life sentences to be served consecutively. He would have been eligible for parole after serving 25 years. Tsutomu Miyazaki Tsutomu Miyazaki, popularly known as the Little Girl Murderer or the Otaku Murderer, was a Japanese serial killer who murdered four young girls. Also a cannibal and a necrophile, he was apparently influenced by Japanese anime and pornography. He used to preserve body parts of his victims as trophies. Miyazaki had originally intended to be an English teacher but later he trained to become a photo technician. His first victim was a four-year-old girl named Mari Kano. It wasn't long after that he continued his killings and murdered three more young girls. The murder shocked the general public and he became known as the, the Little Girl Murderer in the media. Despite a massive investigation by the police, he evaded capture for a very long time. He was finally captured when he was trying to take pictures of a girl whose father caught him in the act. He was returning to his car when he was arrested by police officers. Later, he blamed his alter ego Ratman for his terrible crimes. Though the defense tried to present him as insane, he was eventually sentenced to death in April 1997. His execution took place after a period of 11 years. Tsutomu Miyazaki was born on August 21, 1962 in Itsukechi, Tokyo, Japan. He was born with deformed hands a result of his premature birth. It was later found that he was not the biological child of his mother, but was actually born out of an incestuous relationship between his father and older sister. He attended the Itsukechi Elementary School where he mostly kept to himself as he was incessantly bullied due to his deformed hands. His parents used to put immense pressure on him to perform well. Later he attended Meidai Nakano High School in Nakano, Tokyo. He used to be a star student during his early years though later his grades started dropping dramatically. He initially planned to study to become an English teacher but eventually changed his mind and went to a local junior college where he trained to become a photo technician. He had a troubled childhood and did not have good relations with his parents or siblings. He was supported only by his grandfather. After the death of his grandfather in 1988, he became quite isolated and went into depression. A few days later, one of his sisters caught him watching her as she was taking a shower. She told him to leave and he responded by attacking her. When his mother came to know about the incident, she scolded him and he attacked her as well. Tsutomu Miyazaki's first victim was a four-year-old girl named Mari Kano. On August 22, 1988, she went missing after he took her in his car to the outskirts of Tokyo, where he murdered her by strangling her. Later, he sexually abused her corpse and left it in the hills. He also took photographs of the gruesome event. He took home her clothes as souvenirs. He returned to her body after a few days and cut off her hands and legs. His second victim was Masami Yoshizawa, who was only seven years old. He picked her up while she was walking along the road and took her to the same place where he had killed Mari. There he strangled and killed her as well. After performing sexual activities with the corpse, he left it just a few yards away from his previous victim. His next victim was Erika Namba, whom he kidnapped on December 12, 1988 while she was returning from a friend's house. He forced her into his car and then took her to a parking lot in Nagyuri, Saitama. He forced her to remove her clothes and took several photos of her before killing her. He disposed of her clothes in a wooded area and left her body in the adjoining parking lot. His fourth and last victim was Ayako Nomoto, a five-year-old. He first convinced her to let him take pictures of her, after which he killed her. He took the corpse to his apartment and performed sexual activities with it for two days. Later he dismembered the corpse and hid the torso in a cemetery and the head in the nearby hills. He kept the hands with himself and ate parts of them. When Tsutomu Miyazaki was trying to take new pictures of a girl on July 23, 1989, he was confronted by her father who immediately informed the police. When Miyazaki returned to his car, he was arrested by the policeman. The police searched his house and found video footage and pictures of his victims. Miyazaki remained indifferent after his capture and showed no remorse. 
the media named him the otaku murderer due to his obsession with anime. His collection of pornography was also blamed for adding to his perversion. His father was ashamed of his actions and refused to pay for his son's legal defense. He eventually committed suicide. During his trial, Miyazaki talked nonsensically and blamed his alter ego the Rat Man for forcing him to commit the murders. He also justified his killings saying they were acts of benevolence. Not only did he not display any remorse, he actually felt proud of himself and his deeds. Despite many attempts to label him as insane, he was sentenced to death on April 14, 1997. His death sentence was upheld by the Tokyo High Court and later by the Supreme Court of Justice. He was hanged till death on June 17, 2008. Bobby Joe Long Bobby Joe Long was an American serial killer and rapist who was executed by lethal injection for the murder of Michelle Denise Sims. He was initially known for raping about 50 women by contacting them through classified ads. He thus earned the nickname of the classified ad rapist. He later moved to Tampa Bay and went on a rape and murder spree. His victims were mostly young prostitutes. He would convince them to sit in his car, drive them to his home, rape them, and then kill them by strangling, bludgeoning, or slitting their throats. One of his last victims, 17-year-old Lisa McVeigh, somehow survived, but after being raped multiple times in an ordeal that lasted for 26 hours. She later helped the police arrest him. Bobby eventually received multiple life sentences and a death sentence for his crimes. Lisa McVeigh was one of the witnesses present at his execution on May 23, 2019. In 1974, Bobby got married to his high school sweetheart, Cynthia Bartlett. They had two children. However, in 1980, she filed for divorce. Bobby initially lived on the 2500 block of Eucalyptus Avenue, Long Beach, California. In 1981, he started contacting women through classified ads such as the Penny Saver. He would respond to ads put up by sellers of small appliances, and whenever he found a woman alone at home, he raped her. Bobby had raped at least 50 women in and around Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Ocala, and Dade County. He thus came to be known as the classified ad rapist and was convicted for his crimes. However, he then applied for a new trial, following which the charges against him were dropped. In 1983, Bobby moved to the Tampa Bay area. The naked body of his first victim was found by the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, HCSO, in May 1984. This started a long investigation and revealed that Bobby had kidnapped, raped, and murdered at least 10 women in the Tampa Bay area. In 1984, Bobby was apparently on probation for assault. He would drive around in his Dodge Magnum, searching for his victims. Most of his victims were prostitutes. He later claimed they had approached him. He convinced them get into his car. He then took them to his home, where he tied them up. He raped them and mostly strangled them to death, though he had murdered some of his victims by bludgeoning them or slitting their throats. Bobby then set his victims' bodies up on display. His ten known murder victims were Artisan Wick, killed on March 27, 1984, and Jin T. Long, killed on May 13, 1984, Michelle Denise Sims, killed on May 27, 1984, Elizabeth Laudenbach, killed on June 8, 1984, Vicky Marie Elliott, killed on September 7, 1984, Chanel Devon Williams, killed on October 7, 1984, Karen Beth Dinsfriend, killed on October 14, 1984, Kimberly Kyle Hobbs, killed on October 31, 1984, Virginia Lee Johnson, killed on November 6, 1984, and Kim Marie Swan, killed on November 11, 1984. All of these murders took place within a span of eight months. There were others who had survived, such as Linda Nuttall, who was assaulted in May 1984, and Lisa McVeigh, who was assaulted on November 3, 1984. It was Lisa McVeigh who eventually led the police on Bobby's trail and helped them arrest him. On November 3, 1984, at around 2 a.m., Lisa McVeigh, then 17, was on her way home on her bike from the Krispy Kreme outlet where she worked. Apparently, 
Lisa's grandmother's boyfriend had been sexually abusing her for a long time, and she had even contemplated suicide a few hours earlier the same day. Before she could reach home, Bobby abducted her, blindfolded her, and took her to his apartment. He then raped her throughout a 26-hour period. Lisa, who had been depressed earlier, suddenly felt the need to live, during this ordeal. Lisa used her intelligence and tried to get friendly with Bobby to save her life. He was impressed and even washed her hair in his bathroom. They had a long conversation, where Bobby spoke of his hatred for women. Lisa told him she wanted to be his girlfriend and also lied that her father had been sick and that she was his only caregiver. While in his bathroom, Lisa touched whatever item she could, to leave as many fingerprints possible. In the wee hours of November 4th, Bobby asked Lisa to get into his car and drove to an ATM. There, Lisa peeked from under her blindfold and could just read the word Magnum written on the car dashboard. Bobby then drove a little further and let Lisa go, after telling her to keep her blindfold on for five minutes. After Bobby drove away, Lisa went straight to the police and told them about her ordeal. On November 16, 1984, Bobby was arrested near a movie theater. He was charged with sexual battery and the abduction of Lisa. Investigators got a confession from Bobby regarding Lisa's case. However, subsequent interrogation revealed Bobby was related to a large number of previously unsolved sexual crimes and homicides in the Tampa Bay region. He was not provided an attorney and finally confessed to eight murders in Hillsborough County and one in Pasco County. DNA analysis by the FBI eventually linked Bobby's car to most of the victims. While the Hillsborough County State Attorney's Office produced their evidence, the State Attorney and the Public Defender's Office of Hillsborough County decided on a plea bargain for eight homicides and the kidnapping and sexual assault of Lisa McVeigh. On September 24, 1985, Bobby pled guilty to eight murders, as two of the ten bodies of his supposed murder victims had not been found till after his arrest. He received 26 life sentences without parole and 7 life sentences with the possibility of parole 25 years later. He was also sentenced to death for the murder of Michelle Denise Sims. In February 1999, he tried to disrupt the proceedings by accusing the Capitol Collateral Regional Council of revealing his personal letters to an author, which meant they had broken their rules. However, the accusations were proved baseless. The Florida Department of Corrections later stated that Bobby was eventually given four 99-year sentences, a 5-year sentence, 28 life sentences, and a death sentence. He was imprisoned at the Florida State Prison. The Governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, signed Bobby's death warrant on April 23, 2019. On May 23, 2019, over 30 years after his conviction, Bobby was executed by lethal injection. He had roast beef, french fries, bacon, and soda for his last meal. Interestingly, Lisa McVeigh, who is now married and works in law enforcement, was one of the witnesses of his execution and watched it sitting in the front row. As we conclude our exploration into the depths of human depravity, we hope that shedding light on the stories of these infamous serial killers serves as a reminder of the importance of vigilance and the tireless efforts of law enforcement in bringing these criminals to justice. If you found this video informative or thought-provoking, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content. Stay safe, and remember, the darkness can never fully eclipse the light of justice.